Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. Before we start, maybe you tell me a little bit about yourselves. So let's have a few votes here, or like uh, raising your hands. So who is from, not from Germany here? Okay, so we are only 10%, maybe non-Germans. What about, how many here have already an idea how to start or what to start as a company? Since there's so much light, looks like maybe 20%. Is that 20% who's good at math? One of you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? So usually we are always good at math, so yeah, at least they say so. So 20% uh, founders, like potential founders uh, in the very near future, 80% long-term founders or mid-term founders, and then 10% international. So what do I want to talk about today? I want to tell you a little bit about the amazing opportunity that's out there for you. I want to tell you a little bit about founders, that have done it, founders that were very much like yourselves. Yeah, I think in many ways, your next neighbor can be one of the best founders in the future. And I think to make that very clear what those founders have done, we will talk about a few founders. And then we talk about a few opportunities in one particular sector. But I very much would like to open it up as much as we can to you. So whenever there is uh, a question, whenever there is something that you want to comment, please do so. So, what is this opportunity? None of you is Daimler Chrysler. None of you is Volkswagen. None of you is Deutsche Bank. None of you is uh, Thyssen or any of the big companies. So you are... Oh, this went too fast, so basically... You are on the left side. You're not the fat one on the right side. <laughs> yeah? So you are the little one. Yeah? I mean, how old is the boy? Six. Six? I think a little older, no? Yeah? Okay. So he's six. So that's you. Can you imagine that's you? Yeah. He looks a little bit. He's dark hair also, no? You have dark hair. <laughs> yeah? So, uh, yeah? I'm not the fat one. So. Yeah, you're not the fat one. No, the, the fat one is not here. Yeah? Because the fat one is the old one, is the one where you go in your history books. Siemens, 1880, or I don't know, yeah, look it up. Yeah, that's what Wikipedia is for. Uh, Daimler Chrysler, I don't know, when did they start the um, automobile? 1885 or so. Yeah, so they teach us all those things about a century old. Yeah, those are the companies that are 100 billion market cap, 50 billion market cap, 20 billion market cap and they existed for 50 years, 75 years, 100 years, 150 years. And you need to find a way to get a piece of their business. Directly, indirectly, because ultimately the consumer has only a limited amount of money. Yeah? Or a business has a limited amount of budget. So you have to get that budget. You have to get a piece of it. The Tesla founder had to get the car budget from you instead of that car budget going to Daimler Chrysler or BMW. So there is an amazing opportunity out there for those little Davids. Because no matter how big, how no matter how big those companies are, they can be all eaten up for lunch, and that has been done over and over again. So let's take a look. When I was at uh, this university, there were still famous names in publishing. Axel Springer. <laughs> um, now I need to be careful. Watz, uh, Westdeutsche Zeitung, something like that. Yeah, a newspaper. Um, what else? What other public? Spiegel, Stern, I don't know, uh, Gruner und Jahr, all those famous names, you know? And they felt for a very long time very secure, very safe, very much, you know, we are making money, we are having newsstands, we have distribution channels, we have famous journalists, we have those amazing pictures. And then, two Russian immigrants came. 
Yeah? Two Russian immigrants came and built a business much, much larger than theirs. And a business that took a big part of the business that originally belonged to them, because ultimately all those big publishing groups were all about content, learning, finding, getting to know things. The same actually happened with the Yellow Pages. There were so many very proud Yellow Page owners, you know, of this telephone book. And you had to pay, as a small business, $2,000 a year for performance you don't really know. It was not paid per performance. It was paid per, paid per listing, yeah? a subscription. And there was no direct link to performance. Then, there were other very famous people, like, for example, the founder of this, or let's say the, the uh, main uh, investor, the main uh, charity uh, donor of this university, Otto von Beisheim. He did something very smart. He went, when he was young, to America and saw that they were doing cash and carry. And so he came back and said, I can do the same, but I can maybe even do it better. And so build a company called Metro, Cash and Carry. And when I came to this university, at some point of time, he gave 50 or 100 million to this university, and that made a big part of what the school is today. So he built, he went to America, he built something. But even his huge group, which at some point I think did 50 billion, 100 billion, I don't know, in revenues, even his group, in some parts like Media Markt, were facing challenges. Yeah? Other big groups. And even, you saw recently that Walmart was buying a company uh, called Jet.com for 3 billion because they needed to protect themselves. And the guy on the right-hand side, he was looking like, oh yeah, like you. <laughs> yeah? So, this is not, you have David over here and you have Jeff over here. Yeah? So, Jeff looked like him. He was not, how old are you? 28. 28. How old are you? Nine. If I remember correctly, I think he was more like 34. He was at a hedge fund, D.E. Shaw. And then he saw the internet, and he said, I can sell books online. He probably had a bigger dream even then. But he was 32. So what shows is you can start as a six-year-old as him, or you start at 32. But the opportunities are there. Can this only be done in U.S.? No. In this university, there was a student, and we'll talk later about him, who said this cannot only be done here. It will only be done in the US. This can also be done in Germany. And who did he disrupt? Who was the big guy? For example, made order companies, companies like CNA, companies like, you maybe recently read H&M, even facing challenges. So again, they were huge at the very beginning. They were huge still after two years founding the company, after two years Zalando. But they got a lot smaller after eight or nine years, and uh, Zalando almost doing three and a four or five billion in revenues. Then, as everyone knows, the same happened to other industries, mobility. And for many in the very beginning, it just looked like Someone is disrupting taxi, how big can that be? But I think you see today how big this whole mobility theme goes. And again, someone who said, I can build something here. And then, obviously, most recent, look at the market caps of the, mobile, of the car manufacturers. I came this morning from Munich, and Munich all famous for the big BMW. But again, someone was not afraid to tackle someone who's big, a Goliath. So let's look at those people, because we need to figure out that you, A, you have the opportunity, you've seen that, you've seen very big opportunity before. Now let's see about the people. So, where do you come from? From Mannheim. 
Mannheim. So Mannheim, is that similar to Albuquerque, Mexico? Yeah, it's not a top city in Germany, no? <laughs> no? Okay, so, I mean, I would say it's very similar, no? <laughs> okay, okay. So then we need to have someone else. Where are you from? <laughs> from Bulgaria. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely like Albuquerque. <laughs> so, Jeff came from Albuquerque, and your name is? Uh, Bilana. Bilana? Bilana is from Bulgaria. So, why cannot Bilana become the next Jeff? Yeah? I mean, listen, he came from Albuquerque. I was there in 19... When I went for the first time with my parents to America, I think 86, and this is really nowhere. Yeah, I mean, you have those Mexican taco things there. Yeah, I mean, there's really nothing there. Yeah, and he came to rule the e commerce world out of Albuquerque. So, why can you, why can Milana not become the same thing? Even 100, I think, is still 1 billion, so it's fine. Yeah? So even if she becomes 10% of Jeff, it's still 10 billion. Yeah? 100 is 1 billion, even 1,000 is 100 million. So even a little Jeff is not bad. So, what about the international ones here? Can you raise your hand again? So you. You look like an English teacher. No? <laughs> What are you? Where are you from? I'm from Thailand. You see? Not that bad. I mean, with the light here, I couldn't see anything here. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm a venture capitalist. You need to see the next Jack Ma. So, you're from China. Yes. And tell us about your history. How you made it to here, or how you came here. Yeah, yeah, but before, you were born where in China? Albuquerque, so small villages <laughs> have a strong to do with your success. <laughs> it's not a joke because it forces you to work harder. You have a dream, the big city. You remember the little Darwin, the small city, yeah? And then you want to go to Shanghai or in Germany to Cologne. But you are from <laughs> I'm from Cologne. You are from Cologne, so. Yeah, but I needed to go to Berlin, <laughs> yeah? <laughs> so. So you came from a very small city. So small village. How many are from small villages here? You see? They are the founders. Those are the ones. So small village, first criteria. Okay, and then after small village, what? Your dream was to go to Shanghai. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then? After two years in Shanghai, I thought it's time to come to Germany. You see? Village. Shanghai Falender. <laughs> yeah? That is a real track record of a founder. Yeah? So, this guy, an English teacher, an English teacher, and uh, look at the company he built. It's yeah? Bad, so. Does that matter? No. So, as an English teacher, he built this big company. I mean, you're already in the business, you're already closer, yeah? But there again, you see everything what's possible. And uh, when those names and those stories are very important for you, because in your life as an entrepreneur, you will go through hardship, you will go through dirt, you will go through times where it's really about almost like if the employees wouldn't see you, it's about crying. This is not a joke. You will have so many like crises and problems. Obviously, the Americans don't call them problems, but challenges. Yeah? But they are real problems. And then it's always good to remember, even an English teacher from China made it. Even someone from Albuquerque. Yeah? To, to lift you up again, to have the same motivation that many founders in America have, that you just get up again and get it going. So, who is from Eastern Europe? We had uh, Bulgaria here. Anyone else? So, you. You look more like Jeff, but you are now Larry. 
Where are you from? Bulgaria again. Oh, Bulgaria, you see? Yeah? So, he was a Russian immigrant. Yeah? A Russian immigrant. How hard it is, yeah? You leave your country, I don't remember how old he was, maybe six or eight or twelve, and so on, kind of, you go to a new country, most of the time you didn't speak the language properly. So there is something, what I call the small village instinct. Small village, immigrant, falenda, yeah? You are in something and you want something bigger. If you are born in all wealth and in Shanghai, and kind of like your father was already that successful or whatever, your mother, maybe different. There is this hungriness to be successful. I tell you all the ones were very, very hungry. They were hungry in a different sense. Maybe one from a vision, another one because he wanted to be like them, another one because he had the dream to be bigger than his boss, whatever. So, when I met Mark the first time, he was not the way he's now. Actually, he hasn't changed that much, but he was kind of like... I remember the times he called me from um, Turkey, and he said, I had just landed in Istanbul. Oli, what should I do? And I mean, what do you mean, like, what should I do? Yeah, I just landed there. What should I do here? I connected with some friends, and that type of person, he was so focused on his product, on his company. He's wearing every day the same T-shirts because he does not care for other things. He had this big dream. And I think what you can see in him is his passion and 100% commitment to realize his dream. All the other things interested him very, very little. Not what clothes he wore, what cities he visited or something. And then who is from Africa here? Didn't you raise your hand for Bulgaria? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay, so you have that connection. So, maybe the, if you lived in Cape Town, what is the story of Elon? What well, uh, is well, rumor going out that he hates his former colleague? Uh huh. Uh, it's also good. Yeah, either you are hungry because you want to be, or you hate something. Yeah? It's just like in love. Either you love or you hate. But this piece in the middle is living dead. Well, it's kind of like so it's like startup. You succeed or you fail. But this piece in the middle, not so good. Because if you fail, you at least can start something big again. So now back to you. Uh, well, the South Africans are very proud of him. But they want to be more involved in this private world, like mentioning more South Africa and the heritage, the history of the country. But they feel a bit left, uh, left outside. Yeah, but I promise you, he, he's so successful because he came from a village country relative to the U.S. Yeah? Relative to the U.S. Yeah? So basically, he was also the underdog. The one who wanted to be something else, who wanted to realize a dream. Unfortunately, he went in that sense to America and couldn't realize it all in South Africa, but that has, has often things to do also with uh, the opportunities. But all of them had a dream, were hungry, and wanted to be something else. This is America, this is China, this is South Africa. Let's take a look at the closest we can get to you. Yeah, Falda, Germany, Europe. So, one made it from the farm. And I actually was thinking that because I think he told me there's not a lot known about the private life of Robert. But I believe he's a tractor child. <laughs> he was driving the tractor. I have heard something that he was a farm, on the farm, a farmer. His parents were a farmer. So he must have driven a tractor, <laughs> no? Or milked, 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 whatever, milked the cows. One of those two things. 
And I promise you, one day he was thinking on the tractor or while doing the cows, I want to do something really big. Maybe a mega big wrench or a mega big internet company or something else. But I'm pretty sure, and I think this university has a chance to invite him and probably he's been here to ask him, but I'm sure he had a dream on the tractor. Again, he did not come from Berlin, father internet entrepreneur, next door, whatever, etc. No, he came from the farm. So, it's very similar. He came from the farm and he came from Albuquerque. Again, someone with a hunger. Someone with a dream. Another one. He was this guy. Very smart. In the beginning, maybe a little shy. So he was more sitting here in the corner where you sit. Yeah? He was more quiet. And what he did, he went to even America and built a huge business of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions. The biggest one in the world in his sector. Then another one too with a beard. Yeah? So basically, Max. Max, I do believe, and imagine that, I told you where the hunger comes from. Some hunger comes from village, some hunger comes from the farm. His father was a social democrat. <laughs> yeah? You see, it can come from everywhere. <laughs> so, he I had a dream. When I met him in the Munich office, he said to me, Olli, what do you think is the biggest idea out there? What is the biggest thing? And then we discussed, and he had the idea. So he said, what do you think of building something like an Alibaba, an Amazon in Southeast Asia? And at that point of time, I think I might have made it in Thailand, but I didn't have a clue about Indonesia. So we went there, opened the laptop, and looked at Wikipedia. And then we saw 550 million inhabitants, 280 in Indonesia, 40 in Malaysia, I think 100 in Philippines, 60 in Thailand. And then we said, okay, our Southeast Asia must include Vietnam because we had heard about last winter's success there. So then we included, included basically Vietnam. And so we had 550 people and we said, that is an opportunity. And so he had a dream and he went out there. He had a comfortable life in Munich, I think with McKinsey and Morgan Stanley. So he could have stayed in comfortable Munich. But instead, he chose the mega cities of Vietnam, of Thailand, of Indonesia, the traffic jam. He took his wife. I think at that point of time, I don't know if he had children, I think he took one child, now it's two or three. So he was willing to sacrifice the comfortable, safe Munich life for an amazing chance, opportunity, nothing more. When he started Lazada and sold it last year in April for 3.25 billion, for 3.2 billion to um, Alibaba, the company was only maybe four and a half years old. From zero to four and a half years to 3.25, I think six, seven thousand employees. Yeah, huge GMV. Yeah, gross merchandise volume, number one in all these countries, and he went to Indonesia from Germany. Yeah. So, it needs two things. It needs this willingness, this hunger, and then, as I said, you need to go through sacrifices. I interviewed a person on the way from coming here, and he told me this and this and this, and it sounded really good. And only his last statement, I told him, that's not right. He said, do you have something in the south of Germany? I said, guy, 
you cannot like limit your opportunities so small. You cannot say, I really, really, really want to become Jeff Bezos, but I need to continue to live in Falunda. I really, really want to be like Jack Ma, but I can only have only two years of time, then I have to do my MBA. I really want to be like Robert, but I really like financial. I, I want to kind of like more, more the asset allocation guy. If you engage to become an entrepreneur, you need to go to sacrifice, you need to be able to, you need to be ready to do everything. Maybe you're lucky and you don't have to. I read about the Red Bull, the um, drinks company, and I think he said he only works three or four days a week. Maybe you're that lucky. But most of them, the people that you saw on that page here and there, it was seven days a week. It was 90 hours, 100 hours, 88 hours, during Christmas time, maybe 79.9, yeah? But, and it always involved to go somewhere else, a new environment, to try something new, to be the little one, Whereas your friends go on great vacation, kind of because they take their money from the consulting or investment banking center, you cannot go. Your partner says all the time to you, does that really work? How long do I still have to support you? Huh? Maybe you have a partner who says, great, go on, go on. But again, that's too easy. Maybe you have a partner that from time to time asks you. And if not, maybe your parents-in-law. Yeah? Maybe your mommy. Yeah? My mommy wanted me to go to Bertelsmann. Yeah? It's good maybe not to tell everything your mommy what you do. Yeah? So, I think really, really important is to learn that you have to do sacrifice and that you see with Max and you see the outcome and the kind of company he was able to create. It works for male and female the same. It works so old, and uh, we had Jeff doing it at 32, and we had people doing it, uh, I don't know, Mark, maybe 19 or 20. Delia was an editor. People say about editor, they cannot do math. I was recently sitting in a meeting with her, and she said, Oli, this is, this is exactly how I think the structure should be organized. This is our contribution margin. This is our unit economics. And she's extremely good at that. Not a single piece worse than any of the VAU students. She did not go to the school. She came more from editor or the fine arts. Yeah? So, it is possible from every academic direction, and that's also where your competitors will come up. They can be coming from everywhere. And it also can happen to the French. That's Sasha. So, also the French can be extremely successful. You know, we had the farmer, we had kind of uh, Germans, we had Delia, and now there's actually two names, Sasha and Jeremy. And those two, I met in Paris, and they were hungry. They did not want to stay of where they were in consulting companies, but they wanted to take on an opportunity. And again, we discussed what's the biggest opportunity. We said there's still one continent left, Africa. So they went to Africa. And again, neither he, them, nor myself had been to Nigeria. So the first thing we looked up, biggest countries in Africa. And then we discussed and discussed and said, we need to go there and build the largest e-commerce platform. But then we wanted to be smarter, different to when we started Lazada, basically not just go Wikipedia, but we wanted to get a feeling of how it's really there. So then we went on Google Earth. <laughs> and then we saw their streets, their shops. We looked at the different cities and got a feeling, okay, we might have to build our own Deutsche Post over there. We might have to do our own warehouses over there. 
But there are consumers, there's demand, there's lots of African talent, and there's a population that is open to mobile phones and wireless communication, and obviously, therefore, also wireless internet. And they went to Nigeria, Ghana, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Morocco, yeah, Algeria. We're now in 15 to 19 countries. They have more than three to 4,000 people. And they do deliver a lot with their own trucks. And they manage their own warehouses. And they manage currencies that go in one year 100% up and 80% down. In a rich country like Nigeria, which has kind of much more oil than Germany, sometimes there's no oil at the gas stations. So they went through sacrifice and they went through difficult environments. So they were ready again to go through the mud because they had a dream. So I showed you two things. I showed you there are opportunities. Remember the little Davids and the spaces, the publishing and the car manufacturing, and there are still industries out there. And I showed you there are people, and I showed you that the people are not that different from yourselves. That is what I want you to take home. I want you to take home there are huge opportunities, and the people are not different from myself. So what sectors? I thought what sector we can look at. Let's take one look sector at the financial services. So you have already those successful guys, but who will be the name in the financial services? It is disrupting the banks, the insurance companies, the asset managers, the savings and loan sparkassen. Yeah? I don't know, is the sparkasse still there? There was one when I was here. Who bets that it's still there in 10 years? I bet against it. Are you betting for it? Or against it too? Where are you from? From Morocco. But didn't I ask Africa or did you raise your hand? Sorry about the light. You see? Yeah? They went there. Yeah? Actually, Morocco. Yeah? And I think I can just tell you Morocco is doing really well for them. So there must be a lot of opportunities there. As much, obviously, as in other countries. So who will be this girl or this guy being kind of a role model, a successful entrepreneur in the financial services. Let's take a look what the incumbents are. Because different to 1994, in Internet of today, there are also some incumbents. For example, he goes in many industries. Yeah? But also Google. Yeah, they try, they often also fail in different things, but kind of they try. So let's take a look. Who do you think of those ones, of the incumbents first, before we go to the entrepreneurs? Let's have a vote. So we sit here in five years, or in ten years. Who do you think disrupted the financial industries? We start top left. How many of you think the winner of disruption financial services will be Google? So, 5%? Five, five. He's this uh, notary today. So, how many of you think it's Stripe? What's that? 10%? How many of you think it's Learning Club? One? <laughs> how many of you think it's Alibaba? Okay. How many of you do you think it's Amazon? How many of you do you think it's Apple? It should be <laughs> okay. So, you see? Number one, people think it's Amazon. Number two, I think people think it's Alibaba. I agree. I also think one of those two, and probably both, probably regionally different. Because if you look at it, for many people, the login and password to their Amazon account is more important than their bank account. If you ask people, what do you remember, your login password to your Amazon or your Facebook, 
if you remember them, kind of, what is your uh, account number and your IBAN? <laughs> yeah? So, what would be if they offered you kind of to store their money there? Of every purchase, you get another 1% or you get like some interest like ING Deba. Where do you have more trust in your Sparkasse or into Amazon? Sparkasse? So, for most people, you know, it's a pro it's a, many of those internet brands are brands they trust. So, let's take a look what they do. And Amazon has secretly become a giant bank. They are lending money in America. And I think they're starting now in Germany too. They're li lending money to their merchants selling on their marketplace to those shops that are selling their products to them. And those are not small amounts. Yeah? It's now in the billions. I promise you one day we'll see a bank account or an asset management product or something from them. Let's take a look at the other one. Alibaba and actually also Tencent. So in that sense, a certain way of the Facebook of, uh, of China. Again, someone with a strong tie of login pass, and both of them have launched money, money, ma money management funds. And they became the biggest, or the fifth, or sixth, and they have now, I think, under over $200 billion under management. So peop people trust their brands, and they just extend, like a TV channel. You do one matter topic, and then you do another. So. Financial service is a big opportunity, but you also need to watch what the incumbents do. Different to the entrepreneur of 1994. So, there are many, many startups. Some of them also very successful. The biggest fintech is probably in Europe, a company called Funding Circle. It's a UK-based company. They are marketplace for SME. So basically, SMEs can lend their money and investors can invest. Then there's a company in uh, Sweden called Klarna. In America, there's a very big one called Credit Karma. What they offer is your credit score online for free. In America, you always basically, credit score is all about your worthiness and you had to pay or it was difficult to access. And they made it free and instantly available and became a huge company. Companies that make it cheaper to transfer money, transferwise. So all those young entrepreneurs said, financial services is my industry and I will try something. And this goes across all those sectors in lending, insurance, asset management, property, retail banking. Fundament all financial sector is up for grabbing for disruption. So, let's take a few more looks and then I think we change to you. What have you learned about some of the, once you have a company, once you're alive? One of the things is try to do as much as you can centrally. If you look at Zalando, it's a pure example of that. They probably employ, apart from the warehouse, 90% of the employment base in Berlin. But they serve 15 countries and make a huge part of the revenue in those. That's the power of internet. You can centralize almost everything. One space, you can all be together. Second, Go out as fast as you can. Don't invest all your money. I see so many startups with so high burn rates in the very beginning. If you look at many of the most successful companies, they had low burn rates in the beginning. First tested, first tried out, and then when the customer acquisition cost have reached the right level, then expand. Obviously, when you have a good relationship between customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value, then you should go as fast as you can but before go cheap. Yeah? Once you are there, that the ratios of unit economics works, go as fast as you can. 
Max went immediately to five, six countries after seeing the first traction. Yeah? Zalando went to all the countries very, very fast, but all after they had tried the unit economics on their own. And then one very important thing. I've seen too many founding groups, so meaning teams, or they call themselves teams. And when I ask them what they do, so let's say the three of them are one team. One tells me I'm the CFO. The other tells me I'm uh, head of product, and then he says I'm doing marketing or whatever. The first thing, a startup does not need a CFO. You can do your accounting or your Quicken books or whatever, yeah? You go fresh books or whatever, you can do that between midnight and one o'clock. The second is, because there's also no money really to manage, yeah? The second is, don't really have those silos. I have so many founders who basically, yeah, one area doesn't do well, but they think in silos. So they don't want to criticize their co-founder because they fear they might also enter in their space. I like much more the founding teams to say, you know, we do whatever needs. Sometimes there are three people on online marketing because a customer acquisition is a problem. Sometimes there are all three people on product. So don't, there's too many people who kind of like split the company early and kind of like, yeah, but that's not how companies work. If the purchasing is wrong, the customer acquisition is worthless. Yeah, so it all has to work. If he's buying and it's good, but the customer acquisition doesn't work, then it's also worthless. And there's too little of this we are really a team, we do whatever it takes, and we do it egoless. Means I accept that they criticize me, I accept that I have to change this and this. And most people we meet are not truly egoless, where they can really say it's more important the company than whatever I said, etc. Let's just take it. And I think train yourself to be egoless, train yourself to accept criticism is as important as train yourself to go through sacrifices. So let's talk about a little about yourselves. So where are the 10% or 20% that were starting their own companies? Hopefully didn't go to 2% now. <laughs> it's a lot less than before, huh? We should, uh, can you, s the movie, can we see who didn't raise their hand? So here was something, you. So maybe tell us about yourself. No, no, but you always start, look, when I interview people, I want to start from birth. Because what did we learn? What's important? Uh, Village. Village. My, my, name is my, my, my name is Maria. So uh, I was born in Moscow, Russia. And Big city, but still. I moved to globally. Germany. <laughs> I moved to Germany at the age of 22. So um, I spent much time in Germany uh, doing my um, postgraduate training and PhD thesis and whatsoever and at, at the last MBA. Uh, but I also was, for three years, I spent in Canada, Toronto. And uh, I'm in the biotechnology pharmaceutical sector. And as you know, Germany and Canada are probably the best locations for, uh, for biotechnology. So uh, I'm here for the first time and um, uh, I have a vision of um, having my own company in the field of personalized medicine. So it's a new, uh, it's a new, it's a paradigm change in healthcare. So we are going to get an individualized treatment once we are sick. And um, I would like to be, um, to, to have my own uh, lab uh, doing this uh, types of um, genomic profiling. Sounds so very exciting. And when do you want to start? Um, I'm still in the... Why not now? Why are you sitting here? Yes, um, it's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm looking, um, I'm looking for, for investor, yes. But are you seeing investors or are you hiding in your little corner and say, I'm saying looking for investors? You have to go out and see them. 
Exactly. So, 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 so I have already my, my uh, corporate uh, presentation, uh, ten, 10 slides, but I was not chosen for the pitch battle, unfortunately. So uh, I... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> who, did, who made the selection here? <laughs> okay, maybe they can change it. Maybe you build in five more minutes today. Someone up there made the selection? Okay, he's hiding now. So... What's great about it, you came out of nowhere, you came to this big city, Valenta, you have a dream, but I think you need to fight harder for your dream. There's so many investors here today. Yeah, go and see them, don't wait for this pitch battle, because again, pitch battle, someone else decides. Maybe he's stupid, yeah? Maybe he's smart, but who cares? Take your own life, take your destiny in your own hands. There's enough. Yeah, when we were walking out of uh, this office, someone else came up to me, etc. Yeah, go wherever. There are investors. Who are investors here? <laughs> <laughs> we have it on tape anyway. So, so you're an investor. Yep. Yeah. So there was one. Yeah, go and see them. I think personalized healthcare, personalized medicine sounds very exciting. We invest in personalized food, so why not do the same healthcare? So, but take it in your own hands more. You see? You see? Thank you. So then we saw some entrepreneurs on this side. Okay. So like um, Robert and Jack Ma and Albuquerque, yeah? So <laughs> a little bit of all. Yeah. Uh, then I went to study in Aachen and uh, then the last four years I worked in a multinational. Um, and so now I decided to start my own company in e-mobility. And what we do is we build an online aggregation platform uh, for holistic e-mobility solutions, meaning we analyze the mobility behavior of commercial customers and then we find out where we can implement EVs, electric vehicles, and then we uh, partner up with leasing companies and with hardware companies and with software companies and with installers, and we build a package out of it, um, well, to, to implement EVs in the fleets. And did you pitch today, I mean, your service must be relevant for uh, McKinsey and others, no? Probably, did you pitch yeah. to them? Uh, well, uh, not to McKinsey, I also applied for the, for the challenge. So far, I was not selected. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have, to do, we have to do this thing completely new. Yeah? We have to redo the selection progress. Yeah? Yeah? I think it's better. Instead, everyone, how much time do they have in this pitch uh, stuff there? Four minutes. Maybe we just take it, we multiply it by four and give everybody one minute. Yeah? I mean, in the end, it's all about this elevator pitch. Yeah? And there you can decide. So, we have now already two people who didn't get selected. What's wrong with VAU? Yeah? Okay, we need to change that for next year. Yeah? But again, don't rely on it. Go and fight yourself. Stop crying about pitch selection. Go out and do it yourself. And if they don't give you a spot and you think it's so important, just get up before they talk. <laughs> it's about being young and driven. Being young and hungry. Recently, newspaper said, I'm now quiet and calm. No way. Be <laughs> aggressive. Don't accept what they do at VAU. Just go and take it. All those people, now they took my presentation down. So basically, <laughs> you see, they don't want me anymore. Yeah? Because we're staring it up here. But I think, take it in your own hands. This will happen all your time and you say, oh, I couldn't sell to McKinsey because this engagement manager I met didn't like it or something. Then go to the main guy. And if you don't know the main guy, look it up and spam him until he has to answer. <laughs> Stalk him until his office. <laughs> his name is Bauer Cornelius. He's in Munich. <laughs> yeah? I can give you his email address. I can give you his private and his cell phone. Just stalk him. Stalk him until you get your deal done. That's how, as a small startup, you need to sell. This was the same for Oracle and for Uber, etc. Nobody wants you in the beginning. So we have to, unfortunately, they want to push me out before everyone goes on this battlefield or pitch deck or whatever. So there are opportunities. 
There are role models. They look very much like yourself. So go out and start companies. Thank you very much.